In 1980, an oil drilling platform disappears into a vortex. Not one person dies, but the drilling rig is never seen again. Lake Pinier sits in Iberia Parish, Louisiana. It's a significant geographic feature of the area. This freshwater lake is less than 10 feet deep and spans over 550 hectares. It contributes to the local ecosystem and plays a vital role in the region's economy. It's home to Jefferson Island and the Live Oak Gardens Botanical Park. It's a popular destination for tourists for its beauty and biodiversity. Operating below ground underneath Lake Pinier, the Diamond Crystal Salt Mine is a crucial component of the area's economy. This extensive mining complex extends around 1,300 feet below the lake with a network of 80-foot high corridors, some as wide as a four-lane highway. The mine employs 297 workers operating in three eight-hour shifts every day, seven days a week. The continuous extraction of salt from this massive underground operation has created a honeycomb-like structure of pillars and rooms. The salt dome beneath Lake Pinier is a geological formation of a mass of salt that's been forced upwards through the surrounding layers of rock. This upward movement is because the salt has a lower density compared to the surrounding rock formations, which causes the salt to rise. The salt is essentially trying to float on the surrounding rock. Salt domes are common in the Gulf Coast region of the United States. They were developed millions of years ago when ancient seas evaporated. Because salt formations are impermeable by liquids and gas, they trap oil and gas deposits. Where there are salt domes of this nature, there are often pockets of trapped oil and gas. And so Lake Pinier also contributes to local industry with oil and gas wells scattered around its perimeter. In early 1980, multinational oil and gas company Texaco hires Wilson Brothers Corporation to start oil and gas exploration in the area. Texaco and Wilson Brothers assemble a skilled drilling crew, aiming to capitalize on the region's vast natural resources. They make a strategic decision to drill on the edge of the salt dome beneath Lake Pinier. They know to avoid the salt mine, but they want to find the oil and gas reserves associated with the geological feature. They apply for a drilling permit for a series of locations. The drilling records are publicly available and all parties who might have grounds for an objection are notified. No objections are received and Texaco get their drilling permit. Despite the close proximity of their respective operations, the two companies don't talk to each other to share information or coordinate their activities. Texaco don't contact the mining operators to resolve any discrepancies in their data or to discuss the potential risks associated with drilling near the mine. Diamond Crystal, despite being informed of the proposed drilling operation, don't object to any drilling permits or to initiate any contact with Texaco. And so the crew start work drilling around the clock, working in shifts to ensure that the exploration continues non-stop. The drilling rig is a massive structure designed to withstand the stresses associated with penetrating through layers of rock and sediment. The crew use a combination of drilling mud, a viscous fluid that aids in the drilling process, and a drill string comprised of interconnected drill pipes to reach their target depth. As the drill string descends, it rotates and applies pressure to the drill bit at the end, cutting through the earth and creating a borehole that allows for samples of the subterranean earth to be tested. On the night of November 20th, 1980, the night shift drilling crew start to feel intense vibrations. The drill string jumps, causing the crew to grow increasingly concerned about the stability and safety of the rig. The night shift crew can't identify the root cause of these issues. They decide that the best course of action is to wait for the day shift crew to arrive and assess the situation together. By 0600 on the 21st, the day crew join their night shift counterparts on the drilling platform and it's not long before they notice the rig beginning to tilt. It feels like the rig might collapse beneath them. The crew make the decision to abandon the platform. They quickly gather their personal gear and make their way 650 feet to the shore. At 0810, an electrician working in the Diamond Crystal Salt Mine notices an unusual noise. He looks up and sees a muddy stream of water almost two feet deep rushing towards him. In the stream of water, there are fuel drums banging together as they're carried along by the fast-moving stream. 
Above ground, the waters of Lake Pinure begin to churn and a massive whirlpool starts to form on the surface. The shallow lake now starts to swirl into a vortex, pulling everything in its path towards its center. The whirlpool's force is so powerful that it looks like someone has pulled a giant plug at the bottom of the lake, causing it to drain rapidly. The drilling crew stand on the shore and watch as the rig continues to tilt further. Then it starts to sink lower and eventually disappears completely. The whirlpool devours everything in its path. The $8 million Texaco drilling platform, a second nearby drilling rig, a tugboat, 11 barges from the canal, a barge loading dock, 30 hectares of Jefferson Island and its botanical gardens, Greenhouses, a trailer, trucks, tractors, a car park and countless trees are all sucked into the whirlpool. A natural gas fire breaks out at the site where the well has been drilled. Leon Sviatsor Jr. is fishing in the northern end of the lake when the whirlpool begins to form. He sees the vortex consuming everything in its path and thinks it's the end of the world. Stunned and in shock, he watches a barge being swallowed by the whirlpool in a matter of seconds. Desperate to avoid the same fate, he pushes his outboard motor to its limits and reaches the safety of the shore just in time. Once on land, Viator watches as barges, trees, docks and debris are ripped from the shoreline and consumed by the whirlpool. Below ground, the electrician raises the alarm. He shouts to the shift foreman who sets off the mine's emergency light, which flashes in a warning pattern. 51 miners are below ground. If they see the signal, they know it means get out of the mine now. As miners rush to evacuate, workers on the 1300 foot level phone the driver of the shaft lift to get him to lower it immediately. They also notify the foreman on the 1500 foot level to evacuate the mine. The maintenance foreman on the 1500 foot level drives to several remote areas to pick up miners who haven't seen the evacuation signal. He takes them to the 1300 foot level where they all wait as the eight man shaft lift makes its way back and forth to the surface. By 0900, all 51 miners make it to the surface. The whirlpool rages on and swallows everything in its path. It continues to drain Lake Pinure. Meanwhile, water in the Del Cumbre Canal, which connects the lake to the Gulf of Mexico, starts to reverse direction because of the suction created by the whirlpool. The force of the water rushing back into the lake causes the canal's water level to rise more than eight feet. For the first time in history, the Gulf of Mexico's salty water flows into Lake Pinure. As the Gulf water surges into the lake, the whirlpool grows larger, washing away its own banks and widens into a sinkhole over 165 feet deep. Water flowing from the canal forms the largest waterfall in Louisiana's history as the mine's tunnels fill with water. Over the next days, the water level rises enough that Lake Pinure fills with water once again. A week after the event, the water level in Lake Pinure is back to normal. The lake is transformed from a shallow freshwater body to a deeper saltwater one. Freshwater fish and plant species aren't able to survive in the new saline conditions. Meanwhile, saltwater species from the Gulf of Mexico begin to colonize the lake. This shift in biodiversity has a ripple effect on the food chain and alters the area's ecological balance. In addition to the loss of the drilling platform and barges, the disaster destroys the botanical garden and a portion of Jefferson Island and several homes. The Del Cumbre Canal is left with a powerful current and the landscape of the region is forever changed. The Diamond Crystal Salt Mine is completely flooded and forced to close, taking jobs and revenue from the local community. The fishing and tourism industries are severely disrupted. Lawsuits and financial settlements are brought against Texaco and Wilson Brothers, who are held responsible for the catastrophe. The total cost of the disaster, including the payouts for damages and lost revenue, is estimated to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. 